This is a special broadcast from the Anesh Broadcasting Corporation. It is May 8, 1945. War in Europe is over. The Western Allies have accepted the unconditional surrender of Nazi Germany and its armed forces. Let us all allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing and relief as we listen to this program charting how we got here and where we are going. Alright guys, good morning, good afternoon or good night uh, whenever you are listening in to this podcast. Welcome, um, my name is Mr. Shane Ko. To the J1s, I, some of you all might not know who I am, um, but I'll be one of your teachers for Southeast Asian History at the JC site. So welcome, I, this podcast is, is something that I, I like to do and I, I think that it serves its purpose and it's quite useful, especially if you want to do things at a slower pace or you want to revisit certain things, uh, at least the soothing sound of my voice is here for you to enjoy or if you're lying on your bed right now preparing to go to sleep, I think this will put you right to sleep as well. So welcome to the cop, the, this uh, podcast and um, today we are going to be talking about our first content lecture and I want to set the context for our syllabus and I would like to start with the year 1945 because uh, everything um, begins over there. There are many changes that take place after the war and we are seeking to understand why and how uh, the world has changed and what kind of impact does it have for further developments from 1945 onwards. But today we are just going to be looking at 1945 and we are specifically going to be looking at the Western theatre of the war and the Western side of the world at this point in time. So today's lecture and this podcast is going to be more focused on that. Now, for your two teachers for Southeast Asian History, it will be myself and Ms. Tan. I have removed our contact details from the slide right now because this is going up on YouTube. So during tutorials, I will give you guys our contact details as well. But uh, for the two of us, we will be the ones teaching you for, uh, J, for, for JC History, Southeast Asia paper, paper 2 this time around. So you can see, this is how we look like, in case you don't know, when you add us on WhatsApp, uh, you can see this is our DP, so make sure that you add the right person. Uh, for me, my picture, I'm the one holding the dog, I'm not the dog itself, but so just, let's just make that clear. Now, today we are going to be talking about the Western theatre. Specifically, we are going to be talking about what has changed from the war, and what kind of different political landscapes that have emerged from it. Now, there are videos that I've showed the lecture group, and I will upload these videos onto the Google Drive itself. So, my suggestion is that because I can't like, upload it here in this podcast, um, you can, whenever possible, you can just go to the Google Drive and view the videos for yourself. Now, you can see the picture here, VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. Let's transport ourselves right now to the year 1945, the month is May, and Hitler and Nazi Germany has just been defeated. Hitler in the bunker uh, underground Berlin has just committed suicide. The Nazis have declared their surrender. And finally, after six long years of warfare, Europe is free. War has ended and everyone pours out into the streets to celebrate. Uh, you can see across Europe, especially the Western countries, uh, Western European countries, you can see that the scenes were something like this. It was uh, massive jubilation, a sense of triumph, definitely a lot of songs and celebrations running in the air. And you could see a huge sense of relief just being lifted up into the air of the European countries. And all across Europe, the liberated countries, all, all, all across Europe, it was something like this. Another thing that you can notice uh, from this picture alone is the, the flags that you can see uh, in this picture. Not just the Union Jack of the UK, but you can also see the American ones. Now, as you watch the video, the Victory in Europe video, you can see many, many more scenes like this and many, many more portrayals of the American flag. 
Now that's a hint or that's a signal of a, a key change after World War II when the American presence is not is no longer just a presence but it becomes a dominance and we'll be looking to track those kind of changes uh, over there in the European balance of power. But for now, it is 8 May 1945. People are pouring out into the streets and celebrating the end of the war. As you watch the video, uh, this could be a question that you keep in mind. As you see the different scenes of jubilation across European countries, what really sticks out to you? Now, the point I made to the lecture group was this, that even documentaries, even videos that are seemingly objective by nature, I think it's a good idea for us to question the images being presented to us as well, even if it's a documentary. Ask yourself, why did the author present it in such a way? One of the key, uh, one of the, the contributions from your classmates in, in lecture just now was um, that um, there was a very different portrayal of how the Western Europeans celebrated versus how the Soviets celebrated. So ask yourself, why did the author present it in this way, even though it's in film format? Another key observation that uh, one of your friends also did talk about was about the, the huge uh, presence of America being stamped on that video. From the flags, to the speeches, to the film itself, there was a lot of fixation on the Americans. Why was that so? Another key observation was about the Pacific Theatre. Well, it is 8 March, it is 8 May 1945 and the war in Europe has ended, but the war in Asia continues to rage on. And it is not for another three to four months later that the war in Asia ends uh, with the defeat of Japan. But I'll save that for another lecture. So as you watch the video, I, I would suggest for you to, to take a look at the images presented to you. Don't just take it wholesale, but also question it as a source. Why was it presented? Uh, the way it was. Now, one of the key things that we want to uncover is not just about uh, how and why the war ends, but we want to zoom in on this very important historical concept. And this historical concept is significance. We want to ask ourselves, what is the significance of the end of World War II? What important effects have emerged out of this war that charts the future for the entire world. So let's go into uh, some of the points over here. Now the, 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 the most uh, basic level of, of, of significance, I think, as the war ends, you are ending six long years of warfare and devastation. I mean, with the invasion of Poland in 1939 all the way to the defeat of Germany in 1945, Europe has seen year after year, six long years of warfare. And that kind of uh, misery, that kind of suffering is something that, um, I mean, you wouldn't wish it upon anyone, but they had to endure that kind of uh, life for the past six years. It's just constant warfare. And so with the ending of the war, I mean, most... Most immediately, it will just be a sense of triumph, it will be a sense of joy, and I think for most people, it will be a sense of relief. So that's a basic level of significance. It is the end of the war. Peacetime has resumed. The second point you see over here is this concept called total war. Now, what does it mean? Uh, what, what does total war mean? Now, total war basically means that everybody, both civilian and the military were involved in this war. Now, World War II is, is really unique in this, in this feature because of the civilian part of things. Now, in, in, in World War II, civilians, whether they liked it or not, they were participants of the war as well. That's what we mean by total war. Everyone is included in this. From civilians signing up to be volunteers, uh, nurses, doctors, paramedics, so on and so forth, 
to the fact that civilian towns and buildings and targets were being bombed by enemy aircraft, civilians were involved in this war. So this war was not just fought by the military, but it went from street to street and from town to town as well, and civilians invariably were going to be affected by that. So taking the two points together, when the war ends, it's not just a, a huge relief for the military, but at the same time, it is also a huge relief for the civilian population. You know, normal life can be resumed and all that kind of stuff. So the first two points over here concerns the significance of the war itself, the end of the war itself. And these are the two points to do with the battles and the war itself. But the next two points in this slide concerns the significance that goes beyond um, the, two, the two earlier ones on the war itself. The significance of the end of World War II, you can also see it in terms of the changing relationship and the changing power dynamics across different nations and across different states. The war has an effect, has a political effect, has a geopolitical effect of shifting the balance of power from one part of the world to another part of the world. Later on, we'll go deeper into this, but you can see how the war, far from just military consequences, would also have political ones. And these are large political consequences because this concerns about where power is centered on. You, in the past, before the war, it was centered on somewhere, but now it seems to have shifted somewhere else. So the war could have an, have an effect on that as well. And the last point over here is that the war provided a common enemy for many nations. Nazi Germany was that one common enemy that everyone had and one, that one common objective and goal. But now that Nazi Germany has been defeated, old rivalries start to re-emerge. And those old rivalries start to, to dictate how the world order is going to look like from 1945 onwards. So these are some of the things uh, that you can consider when you think about the significance of the end of the war, the effects of the war on the world order from 1945 onwards. Just to give you an idea uh, of what it was like in the last few months of the war, you can see in this map over here, on the Western Front, you have the Western Allies, UK, America, France, and some other Western countries. They are pushing from the West, and they are seeking to reach Berlin as fast as possible to defeat Hitler and his forces over there. On the other side, you see the Soviets. And the Soviets, they are pushing from the east. But they too also have a similar objective to reach Berlin, defeat Germany, defeat Hitler. So it's a two-pronged approach. You can see from the west, the western nations. From the east, the Soviets coming down. And this is what we call the race for Berlin. Both sets of countries are coming down from each flank and they are all racing towards Berlin. I asked the lecture group, what is the significance of this? What is, why are they competing over who gets to Berlin first? Well, not only is there uh, uh, the objective of you know, defeating Hitler and, and the Nazis and, and concluding the war, I mean, that's the stated objective, but I think there are other objectives because the sense of political prestige that you get from saying, for from, from being able to proclaim that you invaded Berlin, you defeated the Nazis, you captured Hitler, I think that political prestige is something that you really can't buy. And this political prestige, sometimes we call it political capital, is something that nations, especially large nations, they are seeking after. So anyway, in this race for Berlin, guess who won this race? Actually, it was the Soviets. You can see a very, very powerful image here. And this is a photograph of um, the Soviet flag being raised above the city of Berlin. Now, this is a really, really powerful message as it splashed across newspapers all across the world on the next day. It, it sends uh, a political message because 
it establishes the dominance and the power of the Soviet Union, that it hoisted its flag above Nazi Germany, that it won the war, that it defeated Germany. You know, all these messages are coming out from this one single photo. You take a look at the photo and, 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 and you, you can't really see any other flags over there. Like, do you see the American flag? Do you see the Union Jack? Do you see the flag of the Dutch and so on and so forth? You don't. You, all you see is that one central image. And it sends a huge political message because now it signals to the entire world that while one power has just been defeated, a new power is rising from the East as well. Um, I did show a video at this point as well. It's about what the last days of Berlin was like. And finally, when Berlin fell to the Soviets, uh, what were the scenes like in, on the streets? So you can take a look at that as well. It's on the Google Drive. Now, besides you know, talking about uh, how the war ends as well, we, we, we need to talk about the experience of the war as well and what kind of consequences it left. Now, most uh, fittingly and relevant for us, we need to talk about the costs of war. Now, as I mentioned just now, this war, World War II, is what we call total war. This means to say that civilians and military is involved, and that means to say that the damage is likely to be expanded. The damage is likely to, to, to span across both civilian and military fields. So, traditional war, you fight at a war front, it's, it's really no man's land. You can see that it's, it's just barren land, and you know, the, the casualties here would fall upon soldiers more or less. But with the concept of total war, you can have bombing of civilian targets as well. Enemy aircraft can go to your capital cities and bomb civilian targets like churches, schools, government buildings, and so on and so forth. These are all legitimate targets in a total war situation. Over here, you can see that the major cities of Europe, the Western European countries, are in some cases reduced to rubble. Over here is a scene, and you, you, wouldn't, you probably wouldn't recognize it, but this is a scene in London during the war, during the blitz when German aircraft flew overhead and bombed the cities. This is somewhere uh, in the outskirts of Paris in France. This one is in uh, Holland in, in the Netherlands. So you can see the damage being done. The, 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 the European physical landscape has been changed by war because their cities have been bombed and, and there is a lot of reconstruction effort that needs to be undertaken when the war ends. Now, they have suffered a lot, but in order to recover, they also need to pay a lot. So there's double costing over here. You're suffering and then at the same time, in order to recover, you need to pay. So this is what war can do to you. You know, when we think about war, usually we think about the invasion process. And true, when Germany invaded all these European countries, there was a lot of cost, there was a lot of destruction, there was a lot of devastation. But if I had to go back a few slides, back to this one, another thing we don't often think about enough is that in the race to Berlin, as the European nations were moving closer and closer towards Germany, as they re-invaded Europe, that also caused a lot of devastation and a lot of destruction. You know, they just didn't simply walk to Berlin. They had to fight their way through many different countries in order to get to Berlin. And usually fighting through these countries would also entail some sort of devastation and damage to those countries. So it's, again, a times two costing kind of situation where, you know, they had to deal with all these things in their recovery efforts. So the costs of war are great. Even in terms of human life, you can see that the numbers are staggering. I mean, no war in history has seen these kind of numbers uh, of civilian casualties. Um, you can take a look. Uh, let's say, you know, in USSR, 16 million people. In France, 550,000. The UK, 450,000. Germany, 9 million. I mean, this, these numbers are staggering of people who died during World War II. Civilian casualties also, I mean, these numbers are in, in some sense even worse because 
You know, these are civilians, but yet you see the numbers are huge as well. In terms of the national income of the various countries, you can see that they are either stagnating or they are on the decline. Some don't even have statistics because they are occupied countries by Nazi Germany. So it's a huge economic chaotic situation that results in misery and poverty for the people. But there's one country during the war that continues to register positive trends in the growth of their economy. And that is the USA. You can take a look at their stats. It's much different compared to what you see above in the other countries. And, and this is a big point though, that in war, war is bad for all in, in terms of suffering and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, there are people who do profit. There are people who do benefit from war. In this case, the US was. The US was never invaded. Their economy was largely kept intact. And while Europe was burning in flames, the US was actually producing and supplying the European armies to fight Nazi Germany. So they have huge production and that contributed a lot to their economy. Now, not only that, as they are providing all these resources to the Western European countries in need, they are also seen as a benefactor. They are seen as that big brother who is helping them to sustain the war effort. Now, this translates into some sort of moral capital. Moral capital is, is, is like, uh, like something like you, you do something for someone else and you do it in good spirit and you form this really genuine and good relationship between the two of you in the aftermath of it. So a lot of the Western European nations were reliant on the US and the US was continually providing all this kind of support and resources and all that. And they formed, the Western European countries and the US formed this alliance or this loose association. Um, and they, they had a good relationship coming out of the war. But we'll get to that later. But for now, you can see that the balance of power, it starts to shift from Europe to the US. As Europe registers decline, the US is on the ascendancy. Europe is no longer the power that it once was before the war. Now, because of the war and the devastation that is wrecked in Europe, it has changed a bit in terms of its status, in terms of the power that it holds, in terms of its economic strength. All these things have been, in a sense, uh, shifted to the US. The US is the one that could, have sus could sustain the entire effort. So the balance of power is just this concept about where power lies. Who is the dominant force in the world? Where does it shift to? And so on and so forth. So quite clearly, the balance of power is shifting towards the US. Speaking of the US, um, let's, talk about, let's talk about them. You can see in, in, in posters like this, splash all across Europe during the war, the US was seen as, again, going back to the idea of the, the moral capital, the US was seen as this big brother coming to save the world from the evils of Nazi Germany. The US was seen as this grand supporter of freedom and that they would do anything to liberate the countries from the grasp of Nazi Germany. And all across Europe is, splash, is, is, is these kind of images of the US going around. So, not only is the American economic machine intact, not only is it continuing to produce and producing at increasing amounts, the industrial strength that America has is massive and is continuing to grow. But it also starts to build up huge moral capital. They are increasingly being seen as the leader of the new world that is emerging. This one dominant force that is able to govern the affairs of the new world order. At this point in time, the Western European countries, they do rely quite a fair bit on the US. And because of that reliance, because of that dependency, it does allow them and it does make them form a loose association of states. 
Now, at this point, I'd like to introduce to you this term called block, B-L-O-C. Now, a block is when an, an, uh, a number of countries, they come together to form a loose association and they all more or less align to each other's policies and outlooks and so on and so forth. Now, in this case, a Western block is forming. A Western block led by the US, but with a collection of Western European countries, it is forming uh, on the Western side of things. On the other side, on, in the, on the Eastern front, another block is forming as well. But this one is the Soviet bloc. Now, just now, remember, we talked about the race to Berlin. And on the Western side, they are fighting through countries and they are liberating them on their way towards Berlin. Now, this similarly can be said of the Soviet side. The Soviet side, they are battling through Eastern Europe. And one by one, they are liberating Eastern European countries from Nazi Germany in their race towards Berlin. So, two concurrent events happening at the same time, but for the East, the Soviets are marching through the Eastern European countries and one by one, they are liberating them. Now, what is the key difference though between what the Western side is doing and what the Eastern side is doing? The Soviets, as they march through the lands in Eastern Europe, they liberate the countries one by one. They, the, the, the key difference is this, is that the Red Army, the Soviet Army, they remain in those territories. They occupy the territories that they liberate. So, in all the Eastern European countries that they liberate, the Red Army remains there to exert a level of political influence. And you've, you might have already guessed it, but this political influence is going to be aligned to Moscow, to Russia. So you can see on the Eastern Front, there is also another bloc being formed. This block, you can, you can tell that the nature of this block is somewhat different from the Western block, but it is a block nonetheless. And these are the countries you can see, in, like uh, red and pink over here, that form the Soviet bloc. So by May 1945, the world order has changed. It is already emerging that this is how the world order is going to look like, especially in, uh, in Europe. The blue side... America and its blocs, and then the red side, uh, the Soviets and their bloc. So the significance, going back to the significance of the end of the war, or the significance of the war itself, is that it creates a new world order. So beyond the military consequences, the political consequence here is this, it reshapes the geopolitics of Europe. You might already know that I'm talking about the Cold War. I don't think that the Cold War has begun. Um, you can debate about that in, in IH, but I, for now, I, I don't think the Cold War has begun, but I would say that it is emerging. We can see the signs, we can read some indicators that a new confrontation, a new competition, a new contestation is emerging it is between America and its bloc against Russia and its bloc. So this is what we call a bipolar world. There are two ends of the spectrum. There are two camps and you fall into either one of them. These superpowers that emerge, they are immensely powerful because they are not only strong in themselves, but they have a bloc that supports and represents them as well. Now, all these things are happening in Europe and the question you might want to ask is how is all this relevant to Southeast Asia? European events like the war or even the emerging Cold War, they, the primary theatres of war are mostly in Europe itself. These are such global events, huge spheres of influence emerging out of Europe that Southeast Asia will be affected by this as well. And I will cover that in a later lecture. But for you to understand now 
this is what's happening in the Western world. There are these developments. Pretty soon, Southeast Asia is also going to be subject to these developments. And we'll see how we deal with those kind of things. The last part of today's podcast is I want to focus on some Western European countries. In particular, I want to talk about um, the colonial powers in Southeast Asia. In total, we'll talk about four colonial powers, and these are all Western nations as well. The first one is Britain. And, and, and Britain, you, you, by now you should know, uh, you know who, 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 who this person is, this figure over here, Churchill, the lion, the lion of Britain. And he's such a charismatic guy. Uh, he's, he's such a, a, a motivational wartime leader. And, and sometimes, you know, they say that Britain survived on his words alone. He, he, was, he was a romantic. He really knew how to use language in order to whip up a crowd, in order to help Britain through their darkest of days. Churchill, with, he, with his voice, with his ferocity, with his diaphragm and the, the way he projected his words, it, it spoke courage. It spoke fortitude. It, it spoke determination. And Churchill was not only the wartime leader, but he was a wartime leader that won the war. He saw Britain through those dark days and he was one of the powers that helped to defeat Nazi Germany. Within a year, Britain calls for elections. It is, it is Britain's first post-war elections. And Churchill runs for these elections to be re-elected Prime Minister. And shocker of shocks, to everyone's surprise, he loses the election. He does not get voted in. In fact, it is this guy. His name is Clement Attlee. He is the one that gets popularly voted into power as Britain's first post-war Prime Minister. Shocking news for everyone, but it was a democratic process. And the people chose Clement Attlee. Why? You might want to dig a bit. You can take it up in t- tutorials. Now, the, the main thing I want to highlight about Atli, and you can read all of this in the notes, but the main thing I want to highlight about Atli is that he is from the Labour Party. And at, a, at that point in time, the Labour Party, their agenda, their strategy, was to focus on the home front, which means to say that they, were, they wanted to focus on Britain. They wanted to focus on Britain recovering from the war, getting back to a good level of status, taking care of its people, providing welfare. They wanted to take care of Britain. The significance of this is that in terms of his outlook for the British Empire, he was against it and he was pushing for Britain to withdraw from the empire to slowly decolonize its states and its colonies under it and to withdraw from holding that empire status. And their reasoning is cost calculations and all that. They just can't sustain the empire. Now, what does that mean for our Southeast Asian colonies under Britain? There are three in total, Singapore, Malaya and Burma. These three colonies are still under Britain in May 1945. What's going to happen to them? The war damage that Britain had to endure in the last six years made it unsustainable for Britain to continue to hold on to colonies. And so there's a wind of change over here. They are moving towards decolonization. The sun never sets on the British Empire, as the saying goes, because you can see all the pink territories over here. Those are British colonies and territories. But at every point in time, the sun is always rising somewhere in the world on the British soil, the British Empire. But is the British Empire finally going to set? Now for France, the attitude is quite different. 
the French, they hold the attitude that this is a non-discussion. They are going to come back to reassert their authority and position in their colonies in Southeast Asia. Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, collectively known as French Indochina. Now for them, the colonies are inextricably tied to their source of prestige. The colonies will provide the valuable resources that is needed for French reconstruction, French recovery. And so there's no negotiation for these kind of things for them. They are coming back to hold on to their colonies. There's no thought of decolonization for the French at that point in time. The Dutch were similar. And the thing similar to the Dutch and French was that their attitude was so strong, their will was so strong to hold on to their colonies that they were willing to wage war over it. The French had just been humiliated in World War II. And now they are going to, they are going to go into another war that will last them for the next 10 years, ending only in 1954. The Dutch, similarly as well, they are going to engage in conflict with the Indonesians uh, for the next four years. So you can see that some colonies, uh, sorry, some empires and some colonial powers have different mindsets, have different attitudes with regards to the colonies that they have. And that determines, and that somewhat determines the fate of the Southeast Asian countries themselves. How is this all going to change? How does it going to affect them? And the last one we want to talk about is the US. The US is also a colonial power, actually. They hold the territory of Philippines in uh, Southeast Asia. But the US is all about freedom and all that kind of stuff. So actually, within eight months uh, or so, Philippines is decolonized and given independence. The US signed this thing, or actually the US came up with this thing called the Atlantic Charter, together with uh, the UK. The Atlantic Charter basically has this principle called self-determination. It's quite simple. It just basically means that every country should have the right to govern themselves, the right of independence. They should not be imposed upon by a foreign power or an alien influence. They should have the right to govern themselves. That's the basic idea. So Philippines very quickly gets decolonized. It's a very smooth process. In 1946, Philippines is declared independent. But the effect that I want to study here is about the US, this new big brother, this new global force, this new superpower. What effect would it have on the other three nations, the other three colonial powers operating in the region? Britain, France, and the Dutch. What effect would the US have? The US signed a document, the Atlantic Charter, stating that all nations should have the right to rule themselves. So for the colonies that still remain, for the colonial powers that still want to hold on to, that, to their colonies, it becomes a very awkward situation for the US because the US has to do something about this. Because they signed the Atlantic Charter, they created it in the first place. And if they are seen to condone continued colonization, then that's a really hypocritical thing for the US to do. So what are they going to do about it? How are they going to manage this situation? But for today, we'll leave it as it is. The world has been set up into very distinct blocks with centers of power. There are superpowers that are emerging and there seems to be a new world order in place in the Western Hemisphere. The next time we'll look at how the war changed the Pacific Theatre, the Asian side. And we'll see how those developments will coincide with the Western developments and then chart the future forward. So, thank you guys for listening to this podcast. Um, I hope that it's clear. And if you have any uh, feedback or anything, you can just let me know. And um, the notes and the 
lecture slides itself, I've printed hard copy for you already. They are in my pigeonhole. Um, and I will give your instructions uh, as to how to take it up. Okay, thanks guys.